call that to order. I'm starting the recording. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? There's a report from the policy committee that should be on the agenda, if we okay. could add that. Okay, I got it. David? And then an update on WEC um, CD fiber okay. activity. Update on WEC. Anything else? And Jeremy, I have to get off the call at 10 minutes to 8 because there's a conflict with who gets Zoom at 8 o'clock <laughs> in the household here. So if we can get to the policy committee stuff before 10 of 8, that would be really good. Sure. So we'll, yeah, we'll do that. We'll try to do that early. Anything else that needs to be changed or updated? RDOF update? No. Can't, can't do RDOF updates. Hearing no more changes, uh, public comments. Any comments on items that are not on the agenda that you would like to talk about? Okay. Hearing none. Um, moving on to the consent agenda. Um, so I move that we approve the consent agenda, which includes only the approval of the September 22nd, 2020 minutes. Second. Okay, that was seconded by Chuck. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Looks like Josh is an abstention. Yeah, abstention. Yeah, okay. Okay. So we have um, it approved, it's approved unanimously with one abstention. Moving on, finance report. Um, I sent you all the, the bank statement. I hope you got a chance to see that. So. We finally got our checks at long, long, long last. It's only like two months late for the one and another month late and one month late for the other one. But our bills are paid. We're kind of re ready to go if we need to, uh, to do anything else. So I don't think that there's anything pending other than that. Um, there was some question about um, spending some of the money right away. Somebody wanted to – was this, this for the um, – Demand aggregation software, Tim. I think we we had uh, exchanged an email about this. Did you do we want to move forward with spending that because this would be a a bill to pay or a purchase to authorize? Yeah. So I think what um, what we need to do is kind of re rebrand uh, what that software is. But I think you know it's going to come up in the uh, in the discussions later as far as because we did package that. Um, coming out of the business development meeting, but uh, we do have a, a recommendation of who we would use for that tool, um, the COS systems as, as a software solution. Okay, sounds good. Um, so good segue here, unless anybody has any questions about the, the bank statement and so on. Um, let's move on to uh, project manager's report. Tim, anything that you want to report back? Um, yeah, I think uh, just to give a you know an update on what uh, what I've been up to, um, I've uh, worked on uh, with the assistance of others on the on the uh, board creating a spreadsheet that's now tracked our grants and loan opportunities, which includes uh, past, present, and future. So I think that's just it gives a high level of understanding of uh, who the entities are, what money is available. Uh, and then what provisions and timing uh, those are. So I think that's a helpful resource going forward that we can update. I have issued a request for capabilities and interest to uh, 18 different uh, potential ISP partners. Uh, the deadline for those uh, coming back is this Friday. Uh, we've already started to receive some of those. So that'll start to develop um, who is interested and in what capacities they're interested in in partnering with us in the future. Uh, I did work. It won't uh, necessarily come to uh, be used in the near future, but I did develop a uh, whole inventory draft RFP that we can use in the future as those needs arise, um, whether that's in um, into the uh, pilot flu, uh, blue route or something in the future. Um, and also working on identifying potential partners for marketing and website development work that will likely come out of uh, some monies that we'll receive. So starting to find out who's out there and, and what entities uh, I would uh, we could recommend. And also just, uh, I'd say, business outreach with uh, not just um, with the ISPs in the more near term of who uh, who can help us in the near future. 
And then as far as looking forward, um, obviously there's gonna be some recommendations coming out of this evening for some funding through, uh, through the legislative money. So um, looking at managing those projects that come out of it and also working in closer concert with uh, Chalk and the Communications Committee, potentially on marketing, uh, website and communications, uh, more customer outreach and canvassing. And also uh, working on the uh, VITA application, uh, understanding what those requirements are, what does CB Fiber need to present to have a solid um, application that would be um, amendable to their uh, expectations in, in favor of uh, loaning the, uh, the money for 2021. So that's all I've got for report. Any questions for Tim? <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, let's go on, uh, let's do the update on WEC, David. Okay, so the, uh, there was a very productive meeting with WEC uh, maybe 10 days ago and um, sorting out who's doing what and whatever in terms of, um, it was with the full board. Uh, the board did decide that they have told the staff to move forward with trying to set up a um, fiber to all their customers. And the basic outcome from that too is that we have agreed to develop an MOU between CV Fiber and WEC uh, in terms of defining what our relationships are and how we would go forward. And I have started to do an outline of that, but I think we basically will need to hire a lawyer and an account, I don't know, some financial person to really I mean, the MOU is only to specify what would later come in various contracts. But anyway, I just want to let everybody know that that's the next step with WEC. And now that they've decided to move forward with what at least get closer to what they're doing. And they have finished completing their feasibility study with uh, NRTC. And um, so it was a really good meeting. I mean, it was EC Fiber, CV Fiber, and Kingdom Fiber made presentations to the full board. And then after our presentations, the board had discussions with the staff and made these recommendations. So I see it as progress finally, and getting an MOU together is gonna, we should probably try to get it done in the next month or so, at least a good draft. So I'd be looking for help on that, um, both from Tim and from whatever resource we need to. And I don't know if we need to spend money yet to do that, but we may need some professional help. Okay, any questions for David about, about this? So what exactly did WEC say it was going to do? They've made a decision to string fiber? They told their staff to, to start pursuing that. They didn't make a, what is, a, a, basically, all right, so it, it, the, the steps are the board, the staff have to prepare a document for the Public Utilities Commission to get approval to take on this new venture and they need to do that in order to get money from our us so it sort of is a go-ahead but they still have a couple of hoops to go through and maybe michael knows better than i do the the um the steps that are required but basically they directed the staff to to do this um doesn't mean they're going to get if they don't get the money they can't do it but they got to go through the steps to prove that it wouldn't impact their rate payers that's the main thing right michael mm -hmm. So step one, the board passed a motion, two motions unanimously, that they wanted to put fiber on all their poles in support of their electrical utility needs and to make the excess capacity available for communications. And the way they want to do it is to pay for it themselves by borrowing money from USDA Rural Utility Services, RUS. And it could be somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million. Right. And in order to borrow $25 million from RUS, they have to go to the PUC and get permission to do that because they will have to so that it won't impact negatively on ratepayers. So the process has started that they're 
laying out a plan. They don't have it in place yet, but they will. I'm pretty sure they will go to the PUC and ask for permission to do this. Then there's this CFC, which is their mortgage holder bank, which is separate from RUS, and they're involved. And I'll not go into that detail. Um, but they hope that by in several months, they'll be in a position to make agreements with CV Fiber and others based on their process to get the RUS money, which could take eight months to get that money because of all the bureaucracy and due diligence that has to occur. And I guess that's probably sufficient unless someone has more questions. Well, the one more question I have is, the, are the entities who will be able to access the system pay to use it? Is that restricted to nonprofits or could a for-profit also buy space on the broadband, on, on the fiber? Fiber is entering into an MOU with WEC. EC Fiber is entering into an MOU with WEC and CV Fiber is entering into an MOU with WEC. We all are relatively in agreement with some some fine points that are different, which is why there's going to be individual MOUs, I guess, the best I can answer in a public meeting. Yes, what I'm what I'm really asking is what if Comcast or Consolidated wants to wants to buy some space on the network, would they be able to do it? Or has that not been determined? And let me tell you what I'm getting at. I mean, is, is this really good news? Should we all be jumping up and down? I mean, this is like this is like uh, waking up and finding you're surrounded by candy and a thousand, a thousand <laughs> cherub, you know, seraphim and all that other kind of stuff. Or, or, or is it really just hurry up and wait this, and maybe it's going to happen? This is, really, this is really good news. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> That's all. Stop there. Will you? Stop yeah. there. I'm happy. It sounds good. <laughs> it's just taken more than a year to get to this point, and we're very <laughs> happy. With it. You're expressing a history of pain, so I appreciate your efforts. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions about uh, about WEC? Okay. Not seeing any. Um, uh, let's do so uh, while we have you in the hot seat there, Alan, you want to talk about the, the policy committee? Sure. And let, let me first explain, uh, Phil, Phil is not able to be with us. Um, he had, he had an accident and, and he's, he's recuperating and is in some, some degree of pain, I guess. So a uh, zoom meeting was the last thing he wanted to face. So he asked me to, to run us through the policy committee. Policy committee met last Wednesday, well, the past Wednesday, and you got the recommendation. I think Phil sent it around. He actually sent it in two pieces. Um, he sent around the piece where we uh, are proposing that to address the question that was brought up at a previous meeting about conflict of interest regarding contractors, subcontractors, that we actually uh, add a new section to our current, the board's current conflict of interest policy. And that's the section F that uh, Phil sent around. If you look at the, at the end of the uh, conflict of interest policy, you'll find it. And then there's a second piece. And the second piece is we propose language that uh, should be, must be added to all contracts going forward that CV Fiber wants to enter into. And that's the short language that has to do with making sure that the contractor realizes it has responsibility for discerning, finding out if any possible subcontractors might have a conflict of interest. And um, in both cases, if any conflicts of interest are identified, uh, approval of the CV fiber, we recommend the executive committee is needed before any contracts or agreements can be executed. So what we tried to do was to, was to, was to, was to address the problem that was presented, what a number of months ago, uh, concerning a conflict of interest of a subcontractor. And without having to rewrite everything and 
get into hiring a lawyer to make sure the language was fine and all that, uh, we thought it would be practical and would actually be effective to expand, as I pointed out, slightly our own conflict of interest policy to cover contractors. And then as we're asked as a board to identify any conflicts we have, the contractor has to identify any contract and any conflicts he or she might have. And if there are any subcontractors be considered, they are asked to do the same. So that's that's what we're recommending that the uh, that the board do. So I've I've put pasted that language um, into the chat. Sorry, I'm having a <clears throat> bit of a coughing fit right now. Um, and then you've all seen the hopefully seen the the draft policy, which, like Alan said, is a <clears throat> amendment of a policy that we passed um, like a month into our existence. So. We, we've had it June, for a while. June 12th, 2018. Yep. So any any thoughts or questions? Do you want me to put it up on the screen? Or Michael? We're asking contractors to self-identify conflicts of interest. I don't know that everyone will. And yes, it, it uses the word it's ever identified, which allows for outside parties to identify conflict as well. I remember what gave rise to this whole thing and I think it maybe it was overwrought at the time, but I think maybe we've watered it down a little too far. I'm wondering, I, and I hate to challenge a committee's work and, and belabor it in this meeting, but I wonder if we want to ask the policy committee to consider toughening it up a little bit. Let me respond that if we do anything more than this, we're probably going to have to hire a lawyer because basically what our original conflict of interest policy did and what the addition tries to hew to is a model policy that um, uh, when Jim Barlow was with us, an attorney who uh, work for the League of Cities and Towns and then went into private practice, which is what he does now. He was on our board for the first couple of years and he helped us with a couple of policies and this is one of them. One of the things he did was he, he got the model policy from the League of Cities and Towns and he also looked at the statute uh, that requires uh, every public entity in the state to have a conflict of interest policy, which is why we adopted one as early as we did. It was required. And he made sure that everything in the policy was within the rails that had been set up first by statute and then by the League of Cities and Towns. I think if we start to, va to vary much from this, I would feel incredibly uncomfortable if we didn't then hire a lawyer to go through it and to make sure that what we're doing is legal. I mean, basically, I know what you mean. The self-identification thing is an interesting way of how conflicts of interest are identified. But that's exactly what the state conflict of interest policy is as well. Um, and I think, as we found out in this first instance, we did eventually find out about conflict of interest. And that was even without telling people about it. I think when we stated in a contract, if you're a contractor and you know that's in the contract and you still go ahead and don't ask subcontractors or if the subcontractor doesn't speak up, I think you're going to be in a boatload of trouble. I mean, just I, 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 I think your I think your name is going to be mud around the entire state of Vermont. It's a very close community, especially for this work. And I think most people are gonna consider the risk too high to not do the work we're asking them to do, which is to identify either their own, excuse me, their own or possible conflicts that a subcontractor might have. The other thing is, you know, we've really got to focus on getting our core work done. Our core work is getting internet, high-speed internet to people and spending a lot of time developing policies or spending money hiring lawyers to do it. I, I, just, I just don't think that's a great use of our time at this point. Um, I completely agree with that. 
Alan, are you looking for a motion? Well, so hold hold yeah. on though. <clears throat> I mean, so the the original. So when the policy was originally proposed, uh, it was about giving the governing board or some ent some subset thereof the ability to approve or disapprove subcontractors. <clears throat> I don't think that this is that this is addressed here, frankly, and. Um, it maybe scratches part of the itch. So going back to what, what Michael said, you know, does this have the teeth that we're looking for? And I think no. And there's nothing there's nothing illegal about asking a contractor that we're arguably going to be paying money for money to and asking them to do things to run by us who they're subcontracting with. Um, so yes, I mean, should we have the policy vetted by a lawyer? Probably. I mean, we should probably have that done eventually, anyways. Um, you know, we had the luxury of having a an, a representative from, from Marshfield who, who wrote this for us and who took yeah. who took the policy that he built for the League of Cities and Towns then and modified it for us. So not exactly legal advice, but as well as we can get it without you know without engaging him and paying him. Um, so <clears throat> I mean, I, I I would approve this because I think this is a this is a decent step, but I think. Um, to kind of paraphrase Michael, I, I I do think this is a bit weak sauce. Siobhan? So I expressed similar concerns during the committee meeting. Um, the, the problem is when I sit down and try and think about how to express this in a way that isn't just about one thing or one situation, I have a hard time. Of course, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a policy wonk, so so that's at least part of it. But the other thing is I'm not – during the meeting wherein this got sent to the policy committee, there was a lot of discussion about not wanting to vet all of the subcontractors. There was a very vocal discussion about – not we don't want to have to review all the subcontractors and so that's one of the reasons why we kind of leaned away from that because the board at least several members of the board felt that that wasn't appropriate either so i can't we were trying to weigh that in in this so i can i can see what you're saying and i agree um but i don't know how to word it differently if nobody wants to wants us to be reviewing subcontractors too I, I don't know what to say to that any other thoughts about this well i'll make a quick, quick comment to Javon. um i don't think we should i i agree with those people on your committee who said we shouldn't be going through all the subcontractors i don't think that's necessary I just think there should be a little bit more of a um, penalty or process for evaluating conflicts if, as they arise. But 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 for every contractor to then have to, during the course of a contract, present subcontractors to the executive committee or board to get approval before they can continue with work. I, I don't think is practical, um, but I just would, and, and I'm comfortable with it as it's written. I, I'm vote for it. I was just suggesting it might be tightened a little more, but um, it's it's I'm comfortable with it still. Jeremy, would it be appropriate to say that we would ask? contractors to provide us with a, in, in addition to identifying conflicts of interest, ask them to provide us with a list of subcontractors before they retain those subcontractors, then we don't need to vet them or review them, but that, you know, th they're giving us that information. So they're more inclined to be on the ball maybe because we have more information and we could look if we wanted to. And then and then we could say, well, it looks like this person has a has a conflict. That seems reasonable, providing a list a list of the subcontractors that they're using. 
rather than an approval process, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, policy committee folks, any any thoughts about that? I don't know if you discussed that already and chose chosen. Well, why don't, well I, I don't think we talked specifically about providing a list. Why don't you return the policy to us um, without prejudice? <laughs> <laughs> And we'll try and come up with some language that that does that without somehow creating a log jam if a contractor is going to be hiring a whole bunch of subcontractors and they have to do it in the next week. You know, if we if the pandemic gets bad and there's a lot more money coming and it has to be spent in a month, that would make things really kind of problematic. Um, so if people would accept that, I, I would suggest instead of us trying to sit here write, writing some language, we can just send it back to the committee and we'll try and do the work, you know, in the next few weeks uh, before the board has the next meeting and get, and, and get back to you. And then we can chew on it again. Yeah, what do you think, Michael? Um, I think Jeremy's suggestion was good. I would just modify it and say it does not, the list does not have to be submitted before hiring. Just they have to submit a list of contractors they've hired, and I, I would that, even maybe that would uh, eliminate the, uh, the obstacles. I mean, and it's kind of if we. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it. What, David? As, as contracting, I mean, when you put out an RFP, you ask, you always ask in the RFP, who were your subcontractors working on this project? I mean, it's a standard practice in the in, in all industries. Hmm. What? The ones I've responded to, they said um, principal con subcontractors, but they're going to be minor ones as well, and that's wow. that's where it gets messy. Okay, all right, all right. Let's send it back to the committee. <laughs> right. so, Is that a motion, David? <laughs> so, so I mean, so we didn't have. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we even need a motion. I mean, I think that the, the, the committee can just go chew on it itself. We can just choose not to take any action right now. Yeah, the sentiment is clear, and we know what the issue is. So. Let us have some time and think about it. All right. Thank you very much, Alan. Any other yeah, sure. uh, questions or tasking for the uh, policy committee before before we walk away from this temporarily? Okay. Not hearing anything. Let's uh, let's move along. Uh, communications committee, Chuck. Great. Uh, so yeah, we met last week um, and approved the, uh, the the communications you all should have received a copy of. Uh, I just want to reiterate that those communications are for your convenience. And if you want to modify them uh, in order to support your local community's uh, desires or needs, you are more than welcome to do so. They are not meant to be taken uh, verbatim, it, you, you can do that, but you, you may also uh, add your own personality. Uh, I would just ask that when it comes to material facts, uh, you do try to stick to those because we spend a lot of time talking about how we are phrasing material facts. Um, and uh, admittedly, we may not always get it right, but uh, it, it, a lot of thought does go into it. So, um, you know, uh, if you ever have a question about something, feel free to reach out to me on that. Uh, we also spent a lot of time talking about what comes next uh, based on the business plan um, that the Business Development Committee put together. Uh, we're fairly behind on certain milestones of customer outreach that we had intended to start doing by now. Uh, and a lot of that is intentional. We've been playing kind of wait and see about where various funding sources might start to come together. Uh, but the communications committee believes that at this time, it is probably the right opportunity to start some customer and potential customer engagement uh, and demand aggregation. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the committee uh, approved unanimously uh, bringing to the board uh, a motion to reach start customer interest and demand aggregation along the blue route. So consider that consider that a motion. Okay, I will second Chuck's motion. And so this is this is something also that we have uh, under discussion for the decisions about initial fiber build. And I think also um, about the CARES funding options that the Business Development Committee is going to report back on here as well. 
So if anyone feels like we're not ready to, to pull the trigger on this one yet, we maybe could defer the communications committee motion to later after we've had those discussions. But I would not, I would prefer not to, not to simply shoot this down now if, if everybody's feeling nervous about it. But if everybody's willing to move forward with this, I think that we have an opportunity to make one of those rare actual decisions um, and hopefully get the show on the road. Siobhan? Just wanted to ask, Chuck, have you even looked at Little Green Light at all for, so should we continue it? I'm not even sure if we still have a subscription to it or not at this point because I've been waiting for there to be something to do with it and so I've not done anything. Yeah, I, I checked it out recently. Um, I'm pretty sure it's still active, although it, it, it has been on the order of magnitude of probably many weeks since I've logged in. Uh, so it certainly could have lapsed since then. Um, it is useful in terms of donation, I think. Um, but there is an open question here. If we're going to pull the trigger on a demand aggregation and or communications tool, generally speaking, if, if that tool would be an adequate replacement for it, then absolutely we should simplify it and, and get rid of it. Um, I'd like to uh, propose that as Tim brings to us proposals around that, uh, we ensure that we take a look at the feature set overlap and have a, a clear vision of that. Tim, does that sound good to you? Yes, that, that sounds reasonable as we get to those discussions. Correct. So there is, um, as I understand it, so we're going to be talking about the budget as well. So we do have a smallish budget for marketing, selling expense. These were just, um, these were specifically items for, um, you know, that were in the cash flow model, cash flow model about fiber to the home. But if we need to bulk that up, then, you know, we should probably probably add that in there. Uh, Chuck, are you are you looking for looking to spend some money by the end of the year? I think we had some earmark from the hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah, at, at this point in time, uh, I don't have a concrete proposal on that. Uh, I think the next step, if this motion is approved, would be to come back to the board with a concrete proposal that includes a budget number that that we would be looking to uh, leverage. Um, but yes, I, I do think we would want to spend some amount of money prior to to year end. We have to. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not hearing any sort of um, excitement either way. So is everyone ready to vote? Or okay, I think everyone's ready to vote. Michael. No, I have a question. Um, in the business development committee meeting, we were talking about prioritizing certain asks of the Department of Public Service to use CARES Act money, and this software under another title was part of that. And if we were to authorize paying for it now and then ask for funding afterwards, um, we would jeopardize that ask. So I'm wondering if we should at least wait, we should instruct uh, the project manager or whoever's gonna be making this purchase to wait until we find out if we get funded for it by the department. So, so I, 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 I think though, because we're not asking for any specific. There's no, you know, Chuck's not coming to us with a specific money ask. So I think comparing notes with what the business development okay. committee and what, with what the funding sources look like, I think then we can decide which bucket to draw from. But I think we have some of that already, Ken. So I, I'm not sure that it's true that the public service department won't provide us the funding even though we've already purchased it. Because the way I'm looking at this topic is as the motion is laid out, we want the, the um, software for a very specific purpose under this motion. What we want to do for the ask of the public service department is to do a much broader exploration. And, and indeed, it is using the same software, but that software, as we talked about, is going to be integrated with our web development and our canvassing effort. Um, so, but but to get to the practical piece, I'm not sure 
that they will evaluate our minutes of our meetings and our budgets to determine that we've already purchased it. So, you know, I may be wrong, but, I, but I'm not worried about it. But, but also the way I'm thinking about this, this ask is a little different. It's the application of the software for a very specific use, and I strongly, strongly support it. Um, but the package that we'll be talking about from the business development group is different. Um, and again, yeah, it's the same product, but if we can use the public service department money to support it, that just helps us with our 2021 marketing, um, gives us a little bit more resources for it. Thanks, Ken. Jeremy? Just a note that one of the later budget items is actually deciding on the initial fiber build. Um, I don't know. I mean, has that been decided? Or do that you is wanna... asking the board to decide essentially by asking the board to decide <laughs> to start start reach out and demand aggregation along the blue route. I am asking the board to commit to the blue route as our first consideration. Ken, what I don't see it absolutely linked in that by doing the customer acquisition work, we may find that it falls short. Uh, and yes, if it moves forward, as we all hope that it does, it is kind of a de facto, yeah, this is our higher priority. But uh, to me, it's not, we are therefore going to build blue. It's rather, we're going to take the first steps because we've got to take some steps. So I kind of agree, but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not saying automatically we're going blue to build. You know, I was just bringing that up as a question, kind of more procedural than anything. Okay. What do you think, Ray? I think um, my recollection is that when we had this discussion before, we were in, in, I think it was Michael's suggestion, that basically we're going to do 150 miles. And what the assembly of those miles are is yet to be determined. And so I'd, I'd be more inclined to go in that direction as opposed to saying go blue and then we go orange, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I'm at. I see Michael has his finger up. Uh, to either correct me or to add to that. Well, I, I will. I will happily respond to that. I, I. I think we need to make a decision. I don't think we can say 150 miles and somewhere. Um, the budget that I'm writing does that. Um, you know, what is that? What is getting towards 150 miles look like? for our next year. And, and Ray, thank you, for, thank you for your detailed feedback. I definitely wanna go through those one by one when we get to that. Um, there's some good stuff that I need to change based on those. But I think that <clears throat> we can't do some of the initial steps that we need to do without making that decision. Just We're just gonna choose that spot because that's, I think we all had the instinct that that was where we wanted to start anyways. But for whatever reason, I mean, We've gone three, four meetings where we've kind of brought this question up and there's been some reluctance, but I think I think we're ready to pull the trigger. I mean, that was the reason that I added the agenda item about the, the 730 decisions about initial fiber build, and I'm, I'm glad Chuck is calling it out. And yeah, mm -hmm. we, we made, we can always change our minds later. I mean, if we haven't actually started contracting you know, people to put stuff on polls, you know, we're only holding ourselves to standards that we can we can change our minds. David? Yeah, the Business Development Committee at its last meeting passed a resolution, a motion, that the blue route was the number one and um, moving forward. And so Chuck has just reaffirmed that. So okay. by passing this motion, the board will have sanctioned that decision. Okay. Let's just do it. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, so unless I'm gonna hear any other new bits of information, let's move forward. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Are there any opposed? I'm gonna abstain. I think okay, who just said that they were abstaining? Is that Andy? Yeah. Okay, thanks Andy. Ray? Ray is abstaining as well. I could read your lips. Okay, so we have a motion passing unanimously with two abstentions. Thank you very much for putting that up. Chuck, you, you, had, a, you had an additional motion though that you wanted to make. I do, I do. So uh, this segues off of the prior conversation, which is, um, first of all, we are now going to start going out and doing demand aggregation and producing lists of potential customers uh, as well as some existing lists that we already have on hand of people who have 
uh, put their email address on our website because they're interested, uh, people who have done survey responses. We essentially already have a customer database, potential customer database. And pursuant to public records law, uh, I would like to make the motion that we consider these lists of potential customers as confidential pursuant to the exemptions uh, outlined in exemption number nine around trade secrets and confidential information that may put you at a competitive disadvantage. So, and, and specifically you, you had, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to read that as a motion, but I'm going to, going to flesh this out a bit more because you had some concrete things. So survey data. Is there something you could paste in the chat? You, do you mind if I just paste that, that bullet that you said? Go for it. Check? Okay. Yeah, go for it. That, that would be help, very helpful for me. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm just going to read this motion. Um, so Chuck moved that pursuant to exemption nine of the public record statutes, we wish to keep the following pieces of data confidential. That is establish them as trade secrets. Um, number one, <clears throat> our survey data, with the exemption of aggregate data that we've already published or choose to publish going forward. Uh, number two, our website email form leads. So customer database stuff, right? Um, and then demand interest aggregation data generated going forward. So these are things that could have competitive ramifications if they were disclosed to, to other providers. Okay, so I will, I will second, second that. It. Oh, David okay. seconded it before I got to it. Uh, any further discussion? One, one of the reasons I think this is important is it's, it, it will allow us when we actually start having contact with possible customers to be able to say, we're gathering this information for our use only. It's not going to be sold or given to other people. So you can speak to us and uh, your information is going no further than CV Fiber. And I think that's important. And there's certainly certainly legal precedent for um, protecting lists of people and subscribers and users and whatnot. Actually, just to call it out, exemption number 10 is specifically around lists of people, um, but it has a clause in it that's a little bit odd around uh, privacy concerns. I wasn't sure if there was a, a legal definition of what that privacy concern might might be there. So it, it could also be that exemption 10 is really the better one uh, for us. Um, I, I, would, I would probably just say we think we have a good case, whether it be 9 or 10. Yeah. And I, we can, I think in some cases we can claim both. Okay. Any other, any other thoughts on this motion? Jeremy? So was that, should, should that be amended to mean something that, you know, motion that pursuant to exemption nine and or 10? No, I public don't. Public records, blah, blah, maybe, blah. Maybe, maybe, maybe no, we just, just remove the pursuant to and, and say, you know, motion pursuant to exemptions, including nine and 10 or something like that. So, so hold on. So we'll, we're just, we don't need to establish anything to, to use exemption 10. So we, okay. can, we can read that. The reason that we're going to do this for exemption nine is that we are establishing that these are our trade secrets, that these, that the governing I board see, okay. has chosen to make these trade secrets. And therefore, in the future, we can call this exemption um, for when we're protecting that sensitive information. And Alan is someone else who's rather familiar with the public records um, statute. Please... Uh, me down or weigh in here if you have any thoughts. Well, I can't remember what, exactly what number 10 is. So Chuck, thanks for pointing that out. I'll, I'll take a look at it after the meeting. Uh, you know, we don't really have to now enumerate any of these things. The only time you have to enumerate a specific exemption is when somebody makes a request for the information. But I think we need to know for ourselves that there is valid justification for this information being identified as confidential proprietary information. Uh, and I, I think judging from people's reactions, we're all fine with that. And we just want to have it understood when we go out and talk with people that that's the, uh, that the board is behind protecting the privacy of this information. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Henry? Just a quick comment on the fact that I'm thinking about these, um, that it's important to do this um, in light of the proposals like the uh, FTTP proposals and stuff. 
because we're giving basically giving them money and a list of our trade secret people that we're you know going to get provided for by them and become their customers so i mean at least that gives us um that should be addressed in the contract we have with with um, Waitsfield Telecom, for example. Okay, sounds good. Any other any other thoughts? Okay, uh, all in favor of the motion to declare these um, trade secrets, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Chuck, do you have anything else? Uh, only a call that we have a lot of work on communications ahead of us, and so I would I would like to ask uh, that people do their best. I, I know we're all busy, uh, but do their best to come and, and pitch in and, and help out as we can. And so, um, I if I could just throw a reminder out there of all the wonderful work that you have done and the wonderful work that you still have in store that annual report <laughs> language if you could uh, uh, generate that forthwith um, we are we are obliged to provide that to our member municipalities quite soon um, I think a fair bit of it will be um, able to be easily recycled from the front porch forum notices that we've sent out previously if we can kind of stitch those together um, I think the vast majority is already written. It just needs to be assembled. So if you would be. Yeah, it, it'll be on the agenda for the next meeting. Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, um, moving along. So grant funding update and CARES funding options. Um, I wanna say a real quick thing um, on my side of the world when it comes to this, and I think I'm gonna hand this off to David for the most part. Uh, and business development. Um, there is one final bit of paperwork that I have yet to put together that um, USDA Rural Development finally got back to me last week and said, oh, if you actually want to close out your, your grant, you, here's what you have to do. And there's another additional piece of paperwork, which of course there is. Um, so I will be doing that probably this week to actually really, no joke, close out our our grant there. Again, not that we're drawing any more money from it or whatever, just another bit of paperwork hoopla to go through. So um, with that in mind, um, I'm going to hand it off to David. I'm actually going to drop off camera for a moment. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. So in the previous hour, the Business Development Committee met to consider items to submit to the Department of Public Service for round two of the COVID funding for communication union districts in which we have uh, the legislation as passed says that we can have another $300,000 on top of the $100,000 we got. But the instructions we have, I received from Rob Fish at the department is, well, there's going to be a lot of CUDs that can't, can't meet all the, you can't spend that much money, um, make a list and prioritize it for submittal to the department and they'll award whatever they can award based on that. So to help us with that decision, we had identified a number of projects and we did a ranking and based on the meeting, we've come up with um, basically four projects. Uh, we're combining the canvassing, tracking and website marketing into one, one item and that came in number, I guess number one. <laughs> Number two was uh, fiber to the home in Roxbury uh, with EC fiber contract for serving 22 houses at $30,000 a mile, which would be 90,000. And we're in this discussions with Waitsfield Telecom to pot potentially provide service to a number of houses to be determined with more discussion with them and with um, the, the representative from Moortown. Um, and we don't know how much money that will be, but I've, we've allocated 150 right now um, based on what they had used in some of the earlier projects they submitted for connectivity now. Um, and then the last ranked project is building a fixed wireless project. Um, one identified on Route 232 in Marshfield and another one that's undefined at this moment um, the one that was proposed originally for Elmore is 
really a stretch to accomplish in this time frame based on communications with Cloud Alliance, Michael Van Vaughn. And so that's it. So we're recommending that we submit this priority listing of projects um, to the department this week. Um, well, all of these will require much more work to get them going in terms of contracting and whatever else, but we gotta get the um, application into them as soon as we can. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I, I have one, and I, I did listen into most of the meeting. Um, I'm not sure that the, the question was, was resolved. I seem to remember it being brought up briefly. Um, because this is money allocated for CUDs, and we're looking at, um, with the exception of EC Fiber Valley Net, actually really so mainly Waitsfield, um, are we considering having these customers that would be that would be added as CV Fiber customers, because I would, I would, I'm not sure that I would sign off personally um, as a yes vote on that project unless it, there were CV Fiber customers. At this point, we would need to develop a relationship and an MS memorandum of understanding. Um, if they are serviced by Waitsville Telecom, I believe they end up becoming. Waitsfield Telecom customers, not CV Fiber customers, or um, in terms of you know ownership or whatever. I mean, basically, the idea is serving as many people as we can in the shortest time as possible. Um, it's a good point, and the same thing with EC Fiber. EC Fiber, we need to have a memorandum of understanding as to who owns what and how this money is being used. I mean, so it basically have to be developing as part of these. If we were funded to do these. Uh, define that relationship with them, and um, I agree it's a it's probably an issue that we're going to have um, going forward too in terms of if we end up with multiple ISPs who 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 owns the the asset, um, and you know we're going to have we're going to have quite a split um, district when it comes to operations and how we have an arrangement with each of these is going to be pretty critical. Well, and, and again, in the interest of getting revenues on the table so that we could eventually be pulling those <clears throat> revenue bonds should we get to that point, um, this is yeah. one of the benefits that we, when we were looking at the wireless project. So I think yeah. we can probably talk to Waitsfield. So we're essentially saying, mm -hmm. hey, Waitsfield, we're going to drop several you know, tens of thousands of dollars or $100,000 in your lap to build. You know, who, would, who would say no to that? I mean, really, I mean, as long as yeah. they can meet the, the build schedule, but they should we should either be we should be owning those that fiber and leasing it to them at least be getting the revenue from them so, e so even if those aren't cv fiber customers i mean if you think about it it's the state giving us the money yeah so i i I, th I think we really need to make sure that we we are seeing revenue for this because that's going to help us meet our mission down the road too so i see uh, ken ray then chuck yeah, a point I, I raised during business development, I want to raise it now, is there's going to be a sequence of events. If um, we have put in this application on Thursday, it'll take at least two weeks for the Public Service Department to make the decision um, and ultimately come to a contract. We need to use the couple of weeks to really build the relationship with both, either or both EC Fiber and Waitsfield Champlain on this very topic. I'm not so locked in that we need to own the fiber, but we do have a responsibility to the towns of Elmore and more and more town for providing service to every one of the addresses. And to me, that's the that's the discussion we have with those two entities. They need to help us get to every address. And um, we're helping them, no question, and they need to recognize that this is a this is a partnership. And with regards to EC Fiber, it may be a partnership that we expand along much of our boundary. You know, they they may become a significant ISP for us. Waitsfield, you know, not, I don't I don't know I don't know how how broadly they want to go into our area. Um, but anyway, I, I I want us to to submit to the Public Service Department and with the, with the recognition that we may not agree with either or EC Fiber and Waitsfield Champlain, but having the money gives us a great position to sit down and talk to them. 
Um, so that, that was my reason for supporting it, full-throated at business development and why I'll support it here too. Okay, I have Ray then Chuck. Yeah, so it's one of the reasons why I abstained during the business development uh, approval of this was that who, who actually owns the customers. My view of the world is that we're contracting with someone to build it out with our money and they are going to be uh, part of the contract is to build it out and to be the, the ISP until such time that we are able to take over the operation and be the ISP. Uh, however, we're going to do that ISP part. And so there are customers and we're going to set the, and we're going to set the rates uh, as well. So I support it with that, those understandings, but I'm not going to support it if we're not going to wind up with those customers. All right, thanks, Ray. Chuck? Thanks, Ray. I, I agree with Ray uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I would just, you know, the, the, the Moortown stance would be that if, that Waitsfield Telecom is a fantastic provider, and I, said, I, I apologize as a repeat for people who are in that meeting, but um, they're a fantastic provider. They're well-respected in our community. They give back to our community quite a bit, and having them expand is a great way to serve the mission of getting more Moortown residents uh, uh, faster internet. And, and so I am very supportive of that. However, I do remain cautiously supportive of it because uh, I do worry about its potential to jeopardize getting to more fringe addresses that would not be part of that expansion. And Moortown has a fairly um, a weird geography where there are population densities kind of at different corners of the town. And I find it very, very unlikely that Waitsfield Telecom will ever serve the northeast and northwest corners of Moortown. And so to serve the mission of getting um, uh, every Moortown resident uh, fast internet, um, or every Moortown location fast internet, uh, I think it behooves us to be very careful about what kind of leverage we give up in terms of negotiating a relationship with Waitsfield Telecom and, and just ensure that we're not just giving them the money to own it outright, that there is some sort of bigger picture and longer term agreement there that helps feed the, the uh, overall mission as well. Any other any other thoughts on this, Henry? You're muted. Is there any way we can take over some small aspect of operations, um, even if it's like billing? I mean, we're talking about buying software for demand aggregation. What if it, they just got a CV fiber bill? You know. Um, that's just an example, but the idea is if we had some in involvement in operations, then we would be able, you know, we'd be justified to have them as customers. And so I'm just thinking of probably what could be the simplest thing, which would be the billing. Um, we're not going to create a knock for CV fiber yet. I think that's a good thought. Uh, Michael? Um, I agree with some of what I've heard. I think it was my suggestion in the committee that we use leverage, um, that we take advantage of the fact that we're providing them with funding to build. I don't necessarily agree that they need to be our customers. Um, I know that's not popular to say that, but I don't, I'm, the idea that we're going to get much revenue from little pockets of customers to support revenue bonds is, I, I'm not convinced of that. I think if we do significant builds, that's where that matters. But when we're talking about 20 here or 30 there, I think it's more important that we use the leverage to get them to build to those difficult to reach places in the town than it is to get claim customers and get revenue and, and start billing. I, I, I think we should use our leverage to advance the mission in the town to cover it as opposed to the other. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, we still have those um, kind of those negotiations and the, those leverages to apply, but I 
don't I don't really hear anybody saying no let's not do these you know let's not provide these four projects to the public service department is there anybody who has any thoughts that we need to change the priority substantially or that we should not submit these to the to the PSD so um, so I'm I, I don't know that you formally mo moved this David but I'm go I'm going to move that we send the Public Service Department our prioritized list of those four projects. Second. Okay, David seconded it. Any further discussion? We can obviously sort of navigate and negotiate what this looks like. Um, the memorandum of understanding, you know, statements of work, um, uh, how we are all connected to each other you know, legally and whose responsibility, you know, does our name appear on the bill? Are we, you know, owning the fiber, leasing it out? I think these are things that we can um, kick over to business development, frankly, and well, or or we can we can assign that to to a you know, one person or a negotiating team to go and make sure that that you know that that stuff happens. Um, but any other thoughts about? Yeah, Alan. Is most of this section uh, served by WEC? Is it the dominant electric utility in these areas? In Roxbury, no. In, in Moortown, I think most of it is. Based okay. on the map you provided, David, most of that was WEC. Okay. You know, that, that might be the only thing to consider um, that at some point we might have a real advantage working with WEC if they get fiber lines in places that Waitsfield is not particularly interested in building them because it would be so expensive. but. I don't know enough how the, how the routes work to know if that's really something to con concern us or not. Well, and, and we should also have as part of our contract that they're obliged to provide WEC with um, yeah. with fibers so that they can use them because we wouldn't yeah. want WEC to have to overbuild fiber that we paid right. for. That would be horrible. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm not again. I'm not seeing any screaming one way or the other. So let's go right to the let's go right to the Whoa. vote. Bless you, Ray. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. We've got some marching orders there, David. Yes. Uh, anything else yeah. from business <laughs> development that we should uh, that we need to move forward on? No, we took care of the other issue on, on communications. <laughs> Actually, it's the next item, I think. Okay. No, it's no. All right. So, so um, <clears throat> my question is that: so, supposing that we get funded, do we have another governing board meeting to you know, kind of negotiate the parameters and permutations of that? I think Ken. I think I say this with some hesitation. I think we should have another governing board meeting next Tuesday. Okay. Um, to really lay out, because again, I, I, this is going to have to happen so quickly, to really lay out the principles that we want to put in those negotiations, um, but also in terms of the fixed wireless piece, to really lay out um, the specific activities that we are obligated towards, the identification of an ISP to operate that. And so anyway, we have a lot of tasks. So. I, I suggest that uh, we meet next Tuesday. Okay, I'm willing to do that. Is there anybody has any objections to us meeting next Tuesday? All right, I will I will schedule it. Thank you, Ken. Anything else on on this? I mean, some of these things that we're we're talking about can obviously be be kicked over to that future meeting. But if there are things that you think we need to discuss now, we certainly have uh, we certainly have the time for it. Okay. Jeremy, the only the only other thing I you might want to worry about is what if you can't get a quorum for a full board meeting? What if you instead have the biz development committee uh, take this issue, but invite everybody on the board to attend that committee meeting? Then at least we'd know we we we'd have a quorum to make sure we can move forward with making you know some sort of decisions. Well, so so we could. Um... We could simultaneously warn a business development committee meeting with a governing board meeting, um, just essentially o overlapping. And if we've got yeah, I, 
I, I, I'm, I'm worried about meeting fatigue. And I, I think at some point, we're, we're just going to drop below a quorum number. And then it's going to get hard to move stuff along, except if it's a committee that we know works hard and always meets when it says it will. Everybody, <laughs> anybody else who wants to join, the, <laughs> everybody else who wants to at least attend the meeting can do that without feeling like if they don't show up, they're going to prevent a quorum. Yeah, my honestly, my, my sense is... We go to the policy meeting committee. <laughs> oh, whatever, you know, pick a committee. God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so honestly, I, I think this is such a substantial meeting that we would be having next Tuesday. I'm not so yes, I am tired of being on meetings too. It's been a it's been a sprint of a day. Um, <clears throat> that said, I think that there's enough meat and there's enough interesting decisions to be made and important things to hear. I'm I'm totally not worried about getting enough people here on next Tuesday because if we're okay. be making concrete decisions about our first fiber build, <laughs> uh, we're, I'm going to be cha we're going to be chasing people away probably. Okay. I mean not okay. not, not literally, but. Fine. So uh, be sure you state that clearly in the warning so that the members who are more sporadically attending can can understand the significance maybe. So I, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not even worried about that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, you really ought to, to come to this one, but you know, we, we, we need 10. And if you know, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not that professor that like hounds students and says, you, you guys have to show up. If they don't show up, they reap the, they reap the benefits. But if somebody feels sad or cries because they didn't get to, they didn't get to weigh in, it's their responsibility to, to be here for these meetings. So I don't really, uh, honestly, if if that makes me a, a bad person, I'm sorry, but um, I give I give lots and lots of credit to the folks of. Does it folks. make you a bad person? So <laughs> you're you're all you're all here. You're contributing, and I think this is and I think this is great. So if folks choose not to show up, that's I mean that's certainly their their prerogative. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a problem getting ten, um, and we may not get twenty, but I I think we can we can live with that. Okay. Um, I was great. just about to compliment Sam, but then he dropped off. Oh, <laughs> maybe he felt in, felt intimidated. I'm I'm glad he. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm <laughs> glad Fun he... fact: Sam is now officially my next door neighbor. Oh, wonderful. Oh, cool. So so he it was good good for him to join the meeting tonight. Then for that, right? All right. Um, all right. Anything else on um, grant or funding stuff that we need to be talking about? All right. Let's move on. Uh, budget and annual report. So I've, uh, I think, successfully um, thrown the annual report over the wall to um, to Chuck in the communications committee. Um, I have the budget. I'm happy to put it up on the screen, or we can just walk through it. Um, each individually. I have a bunch of feedback from um, from Ray that was fantastic, and I intend to go through this one by one. You know, his suggestions one by one. This is the first four quarters of what we are expecting to to build. Um, so, looking at you know the first steps, what can we reasonably do in in a year? And uh, I expect that there's going to that. We're going to need to change some things, but I think if everything goes to on goes on schedule and we start the process for our real no joke fiber build in quarter one, so January first, I think um, this should this should be fairly accurate. Um, I can walk through this if you like. Otherwise, I think I'd rather just go through Ray's questions because I believe that this will. Um, my going through race questions will probably answer a lot of your questions. But before I start, does anybody have any any thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, Jeremy, is this based on doing blue as the pilot project? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's going to be roughly the same, but that was the that was the expectation. So it's not, yeah, it's not substantially. Um, it doesn't substantially change if we were to change projects. And and I see some people have hands up and whatever. And I'm, um, it's quite um, quite small. I can't see everybody. So if you just want to shout it out, I see. I think it's Ken. 
Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to throw the possibility there that the Northern Border Regional Commission is an annual um, cycle. And while we weren't successful this year, I think that we will be in a much, much, much better position next year. So somewhere between two hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand um, dollars end of Q3, definitely end of Q4. Uh, w w when we could draw upon it, if if we won it next year, you mean? Correct. Okay. What line item is that? Pardon? I I didn't hear that. Four. What line item is that? That would be grants. Grant. So. I'm not, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable budgeting for a grant that we might not get. I think it would be better if we were surprised by, you know, an additional revenue stream rather than budgeting for it personally. Maybe that's my kind of conservative ex select board member approach. If you all want to do that differently, I'm happy to happy to oblige. It would be irresponsible to do otherwise. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you could comment. You could comment that in those two cells. Yeah. Or in column G or something. So may pursue additional um, NBRC grants for Q3, Q4. How about that? I guess I, I would seek some consistency because the loan proceeds um, is a presumption that we we land the veto loan by Q2. I think that's, you know, I, I'm not going to work on that as an absolute assumption. Yeah. So that, that's true. Um, may not um, receive this beta loan, assuming that we do. I will, I'll, I'll re rephrase this later, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to do that. But I mean, if, if that doesn't happen, frankly, this whole budget is, is blown. Um, and may, maybe we won't get the Vita loan, but I think the presumption was that if we're going to, if we're going to go after the, the 400,000 of matching, then that's going to get us to, um, that's going to get us to the Vita loan. And then that gets us to the rest of the, you know, the rest of the project. If we don't get the matching funds and, or we don't get the Vita loan, this budget looks, it's zeroed almost almost completely zeroed um mm -hmm. so i think yes this this one is a bit aspirational but i think that's it's a little bit more um reachable i mean it's a little bit clearer than N nbrc which which I, I honestly i i thought for this year i thought N nbrc we were gonna we were gonna get it and i think i think actually our last budget may have even included um no, I didn't actually, but but we were actually starting to draw <laughs> draw on Vita loans in our previous year budget. So, anyways, so back to this. So let me go through. Um, okay, uh, Henry, I see you have your hand. I, I, again, I can't see hands up really unless I go and click back on different windows. But I see your hand, Henry. Uh, just a comment that I would I would just generalize that um, comment on row four is. Because there could be other grants too. There could be the RUS money. There could be the FCC money. You know, so they're just not considering those. This budget doesn't include, you know, FCC and USDA or something like that. Yeah. So I'm I'm not not sure that we would be getting FCC money next year anyways but no so, so we'll, we'll just put may pursue additional grants for quarter three quarter four it certainly is possible but I, I i don't think that in terms of of how we're going to budget and plan that we can rely on those but i, I think that makes sense just to to make that a general a general statement instead okay i agree race question was first one was um about the pre-construction engineering and he said this was for fiber to the premises this is all fiber to the premises there is no wireless project here there is no um if we were getting revenues from this project at the end of the year that we just started talking about tonight we can we can change that in our final budget this is a draft budget that we are obligated to send to the municipalities 
and to get their feedback about. So select boards and city councils will get this and they'll have a chance to say, hey, this is really crazy or this is really good or most likely absolutely nothing at all. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then we are obliged to, you know, we don't have to take any particular piece of feedback, but we're at least obliged to have a hearing and have them weigh in if they have something to say about it and then we can or choose not to um, change this according to their feedback. So we will still have another crack at this if we understand more about revenue streams or costs or what have you that we make decisions about this year that will then go into, into next year. Um, so raise questions. I understood engineering could not take place before a poll audit. That is true. And the make ready surveys are um, those, those are the poll audit. That's where that comes from. Um, so th this is not, these are not in time sequence really. These are, they're, and they're not in actually any particular order at all. Uh, ISP, it's not clear what line item that might be. That is operational cost. So this ISP backhaul, did you mean that one, Ray? I, w I couldn't see ISP um, as an entity, like hiring Valley or whomever. Where, where does that fit in? Um, that, that's the ISP. That's like First Light or something like that. That's not the operator. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have that operation in here. That was, I don't know that that was. I thought that was included. It should have been labor. Here it is. Or is that that's just the installation labor? Yeah, that suggests something different to me. Okay, yeah, this is this is the installation labor. So maybe we'll do construction. Okay, uh, so let's add an item down here that looks more like the right place for it. So what? So um, ISP operations. Operations. Yes. How's that? That looks good. Okay. And somebody want to give me some prices? Spitball? So probably nothing for the first quarter because there's not going to be anything built. Come on, Michael. Help us out here. Uh, we need a definition of what the operations are before we can put a number on them. So we hire... Does it include serv service drops? Is this... Is it just back office? There's so many different things back that office ISP does. Like the day-to-day -day operations, we hire ValleyNet to, to do this. How much are we paying them to run the network for us or whichever ISP? Are we, are we also paying them to do the service drops? Service drops yes. are, are built in. Are that's already, that's already accounted for. every house? Yes, it's already accounted for. Where? Fiber, it's, under, it's under fiber construction cost. I wrapped I wrapped all of that all of that into that fiber construction cost. So that's drops. That's all of the equipment on the poles. That's all of the uh, other elements that all the other devices that need to be built for that. I just compressed all of those into a single line item. That's why definitely and why a whole section perhaps having to do with ISP. With these sub bullets below it, so, so I'm, I'm, make I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do sub bullets. These are these are for the municipalities. We are going to have so check this out. We have all of these different breakouts that we are going to have as in our internal bookkeeping. I'm not. I'm so I while I appreciate everybody's earnestness into helping me fix this now. This I've had literally no feedback about this for quite some time, except for what I heard from Ray uh, earlier earlier this week. So, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, let's just say operational costs for the ISP um, not broken out. So is this um, $15,000 a quarter? Is that order of magnitude correct? More or less, Michael? I'm sorry. I, I really have no clue because it would depend on all the operations, whether it's per subscriber, there's so many factors to think about, and I don't, I don't want to take a chance on a number. Sorry. 
Okay, well, the, the, so unfortunately, we are in this place where we are obligated to provide a budget. <laughs> and so if we don't put something but in it here, doesn't it, have to, but it, we're not obligated to provide a super accurate budget. It's, so any number is okay as long as it's not outrageous. It's not going to be a million and it's not going to be 10,000. Is that per quarter? That's per quarter. It's going to be more than It'll be more than that probably, but at the beginning there won't be that many customers and that many miles, so it's going to ramp up. Right. So this is, I, I think, if I figured this out, this is uh, this first year is, it's not, they may be like seventy miles, eighty miles. I, I, I don't even know that it's that much. And it's so. Again, this is my complete. And, and yeah, uh, I'm. I would rather oh, I would honestly I would rather I, I would rather over guess here. So it's in, in this case it'd be better to overestimate the amount that we're spending on this so that when we report back to to the towns or you know anybody that's looking at this and they say wow you you, you guys were completely wrong on by you know by an order of magnitude. So this is why I'm looking if it's going to be much much more if this is going to be 150,000 next year then let's Let's just put it here. I mean, again, we, this is the same conversation we had last year where like in, in, to a certain extent, because yeah. we don't know our actual costs, we've not negotiated these things. To a certain extent, we're making this stuff up. But we have, right. to, put, we have to put something here. We don't have a choice but to submit a budget. And so let's do the best we can given that we don't have um, enough information. And David's right. He was put in the chat. This is an estimated budget. Ray, what do you think? How about 25, 35, 50? Okay. Lovely. Yes! I love it. Decision. Thank Good you. job, Bert. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, le legal expenses. No. I don't, um, I don't have legal expenses. Let's add it. Okay. Lawyers are expensive. They yeah, are. Probably looking at least you could put, you could put professional expenses, which would cover engineers, accountants, and lawyers. Engineers are a separate line item because they're part of the build. So. All right. So we'll how about include like, accountants. How about administrative? And, so, bookkeeping and auditing, it's down here. So you know what? I'm, okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put legal. Yeah, put legal. All right. Twenty-five thousand. 25,000 total or per quarter? Yeah, at least. No, no, total. Here, how about 20? Make a nice even five. Sounds good. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, if loan proceeds equal 1.57 million, don't we need 157,000 matching funds? No. And the reason that we're doing this is if we get a $400,000 match from um, – that's the funding that's being provided from the state, we will want to front load that and spend that first so that we're not incurring uh, the interest by drawing down the VITA loan. So that's the reason why that's first. Um, and it's it's a $4.4 million, $4 million project or thereabouts, um, maybe slightly less than that. So even if you add this together and you get $1.575 million, um, we are hopefully getting the full project match up front. I mean, it's it's there. It's available. It was allocated for us. So let's let's go forward with that. Um, all right. Data revenue is subscriptions. That is a that is a true statement. Um, monthly payments of eighty dollars a month. It could be something else. It could be quite different. Again, this is a a bit of a fudge factor, and this ramps up as we look at getting more. Um, so and yes, you have a you have a breakdown of this is. Um, Eleven thousand dollars per month, one hundred thirty-seven point five customers. Sure, I mean, again, this is a approximation of, of what we're going for. And what I did is I took the financial model and I did a bit of rounding, and I almost always rounded up. And I tried to round up a fair bit because, again, I'd rather be more. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. With the revenue, I rounded down. So I'm going to be more conservative with the revenue, expecting that we're not going to get as much as predicted. Um, and this was all with all of the basic um, unedited assumptions. So in terms of how many, you know, how many we're getting for a particular take rate, that's not 
not been changed, not been tweaked, and maybe there's costs in there that need to be changed or accommodated um, somehow. I didn't do that. I went with went with some defaults, and I did not um, I did not do anything fancy. Looks like I got some. So do we have any pro forma of of how the take rate of evolves over quarters and years? Yeah, it's in there. Not? It's in there. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a slow it's a slow ramp up. I I don't remember the um the formula, but you were able to say about how long it takes you to get to the full take rate that you're expecting, and then it then it caps. Are out. you are you talking about Fred's Fred's model? Is that what you're using? That's what I'm using here. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay. So that's where all of these numbers come from. All right. So, um, see, so a manager contract salary of 100k, and so that maybe that's wrong. But that was, I think, that was in what uh, David you had that in your model for what we had before when we applied for NBRC. So that's what we put there. Um, and Ray says, I assume this would be a full-time project manager. will be crazy busy overseeing all the work. I think that's, I think that's correct. Uh, the question is, might we need a part-time uh, ED just to support the board? And I'm going to go with no. I, I don't really want to budget another position. I think the crazy busy overseeing person um, can be crazy busy and be supporting us as well. I think that's all, that's all part of the same package. Um, please, and please, again, shout out if, if I'm being completely inappropriate here. Is that, a, is that going to be considered a CD fiber employee or just contracted? I think we still have to, I personally think that, that we'll keep contracting. I don't think that it's okay. going to make sense for us to take on employees right now, especially with the ramifications that that has for the uh, um, bonding later on. That makes the bonding much okay. more complicated. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Um, do we need the secretary to take minutes, update the website? And yes, that should be, so I think that gets covered somewhat under office costs. We have a budget for that already and we are paying, Jeremy, what is that per month? 150 and I think there's also 200 if and when we ever get a um, treasurer. Okay, and so that should be accounted for, that should be covered in this as well. Um, although the, the, the bookkeeping, the treasurer, if we get if we hire an actual bookkeeper, um, that's what we're looking for here. And this audit, this is front loaded. I think uh, again, I think I'm taking David's number here, uh, if I'm not mistaken. This is the audit front loaded, and then the bookkeeping, the ongoing costs of that. So office costs that will be our secretary, uh, clerk, what have you. Uh, I see interest at five percent. Was that lowered by Vita from the six percent we were told? Nope, that was just because that's what I typed into the formula. So let's. Just change the six percent, five percent to six percent, and uh, we'll make that make that correct. Okay. So, um, so that changes our our net, though. So we're gonna have to up this. Make sure we have cash flow. Still not quite enough. Okay. So accounting for that higher interest rate, uh, that costs. So anything else? I, I got through all the raised feedback. Is there anything else that we need to um, update in here? Um, this might. Insurance here is a complete guess. Any advice about that would certainly be welcome. Is the marketing, is marketing and selling enough? Probably not. Is, yeah. So what, what, what should it be? Chuck, you had a, I think you, you maybe had a budget for what you were imagining. Yeah. I. I I think marketing needs to be at least five to 10K uh, a quarter, if not more. Okay. Well, if you want more, this is the time to, to mention it. Well, we went right. from 200 to 12. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I, I, would go, I would go about two, two to three K per quarter. Well, actually, no, I was thinking now per month. No, so that's probably yeah, about right. 
Michael, that was exactly the what tripped me up as I was thinking for months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think quarter, I think I think ten for quarter is probably a good start. Far off. Probably a little high, but that's okay. Okay. Any other thoughts? So this was a separate line item. Do we need to keep this as a separate line item? I assume that meant just like customer acquisition costs, like marketing essentially, you could just whack it. That's that what you meant by that? Yeah. Selling expense. But yeah. That was a yeah, I would, I would. All right, let's I'd go whack it, yeah. Bye bye. Uh does that insurance amount? Electricity. Any of these look like we need to change these? What will we be insuring? The the fiber. Uh, fiber plant. The work. Oh, I see. And I see. Okay. Liability. And liability. Jeremy, just make sure before you send this out to any towns, you get rid of that complete guess on line twenty-four, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that would attract notice, and they would focus on <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> Jeremy, can we can we up the insurance actually a little bit now that I'm thinking about it? I was I was looking at that for for um for months too. Let's let's do uh, uh forty five hundred a quarter. Okay. Okay. I'd rather be high than. All right. Can you Q four and and you know storm damage and so forth? Does that come in under insurance, or do we have to have a line item for you know potential repair costs or things like that? So we have some we have a budget for spare parts um, should things need to be repaired and there's a a bit of uh, a bit of slack it's a different line you want to you want to have one called operation and maintenance and that covers storm damage o ODN maintenance that one I don't know what ODN is o o operations and optical, and optical distribution network it's a, it's the fiber oh, oh okay oh uh so okay so that's um a contract with eustace is if we were to make one would be 300 dollars a mile a month in terms of me no no meeting. a year excuse me a year so if, if you're talking about 150 miles that's a significant budget item so say that again so how how much per mile per year? Three hundred dollars, and that is just the the retainer is somewhere is around a hundred to hundred and fifty a month. But then there's the what they charge when you come out and when they do the repairs. And it, that's the stand budget's three hundred. Okay, so we need this to be an order of magnitude larger. It's more like thirty thousand then for Eustace. For a hundred. So what? Well, but just, just to you know, because you're talking, I thought you said an 80 mile build the first year. Yep. Um, and that eight, and it ramps to 80, so probably it's an average over the year of maybe 30 miles. So I don't think this year it's going to be a huge amount. So you know what I'm saying 30 times 300, 300 then. 9,000. 9, okay. How's that? Good. Okay. And that roughly. And we hope for no storms so that you've got money for next year. Let's say that again. You hope for no storms so you have money for next year. Yeah, that's uh, it's it, it's a good thought. All right. Anything else that leaps out at Are you? Are we here? still cash flow positive? Down at the uh, bottom. Well, ish, yeah. Barely. Uh, uh, again, <laughs> this is just like how much do we draw? No, I, 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 I totally get it. Um, just want to make sure that we have enough drawn. Okay, uh, Alan, I did I see your hand up? Yeah, do you have a carry forward somewhere in this budget? I money don't. left over from the year before. I don't. There's not. Is that? There's not going to be much. Okay, well then it's not worth worrying about. It's going to be less less than ten thousand dollars, I think. It's not significant then on a budget like this. So yeah, e eventually, eventually we will get to that point um, where we where we will be able to say, all right, we have this we have this left over, and we can use that. But it's still 
there's so much up in the air. Um, we can expect to not have any of the 100,000 that we got from the um, CARES Act funding because whatever we don't spend gets yanked back. Mm -hmm. um, and we really don't have anything else. Um, we don't really have anything else sort of in our pocket aside from the stuff that we're, you know, that we're, uh, I don't, I, don't th I mean, we have the $10,000 from the BCF and there could be some of that hanging out still and maybe a little bit more of that coming later. But uh, Ray, I th think I see you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking that electricity is really too trivial a cost to have its own line item. Could we either get rid of it or bury it inside office costs? Sure. Lovely. And so what? Bump this up what maybe a little bit. Pardon? What is a wholesale phone cogs? That's another very small a relatively small item. This cost it, of goods solves. Yeah. It? You want to explain that, Michael? Um, so that's the cost of analog telephone adapters and other things like that that you sell to customers so that they can have voice over internet. And that's not included in the construction costs? Well, I... Yeah, there's lots of ways to look at this stuff. So the service drops might not belong in construction costs either. And then there's the the optical equipment. I don't know where that is. Is that in equipment and spare parts? It is. Okay. Um, and so, and so, so if you wanted to bury, bury the VoIP equipment in there. Could be in there too. Yeah. Yeah, this this could probably be in the equipment and spare parts. I think. Equipment, absolutely. The thing is, the the equipment and spare parts is including um, uh, hub equipment that's not sold, and cost of good cost of goods sold is retail retail so things sold, and so okay. it's a different category. Right. So so an, an accountant is going to care, but so care about the difference between. So I mean we can we can bury it in here in terms of how we present it. An accountant is going to deal with this differently than than we will. I mean, like I said, That's for sure. things get quite a lot more complicated because this um, cost of goods sold is not a capital asset, right? It's an, we have it listed as an as an expense. Um, but again, yeah. it's, I don't it's, know. I'd say leave it. I mean, we can't get rid of every single line. Yeah. So. But, but it's it's also going to it's also going to appear in some form as um, you know they're still going to buy it from us, but it's you know how much it costs us then to to buy the thing yeah. in the first place. Okay. So I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to do whatever. Like I said, I've I've looked at this and I threw this together um, based on some of the numbers that David had had and that um, Fred had put together for us, but. What do you think? Are we ready to? Uh... With with for the cogs, you could just boost it up a little and throw in wireless routers and other other retail equipment. Retail equipment cogs, and when we say starting here, what maybe like five five k? Is that too much? It's probably too much the first quarter that you're serving people but how about that perfect <laughs> yeah <laughs> lovely um i see uh, henry you had your hand up and then ray i don't i we can't really spend too much more time on this frankly and again this is this is the thing and i i i don't mean to be that guy but um this this went out um we you know we got some no feedback and i i don't want to i i, I don't want to micromanage this too much anymore, but um, Henry, what did you got? I'm just curious with the VoIP, um, did you have any kind of uh, redundancy or backup power in the equipment costs? Sure, yes, yes. There's, there's spare parts, but I mean, in terms of en like engineered redundancy, I, I, I don't, I, I have to imagine well, I mean, that- 
if there's a power. No, he's referring, referring to VoIP having power backup so it keeps working when the power is off. I, I, yes. I would, I would that's, have that's to. That's retail. I would have to look. That would go on line 20. I would have to look at, at the, the cost model, the cash flow model, to see if that was included in, in the cost. I, my instinct is that it was not. There's, there's now regulations that require it. So it's something we're going to have to build in. Okay. The equipment spare parts then. So let's add 5K per. No, no, no it, goes in, it goes in the line 21 with the COGS. And it, it would be like... Hold on, though. Hold on. For every, for so, every VoIP. Okay, but there's the power backups that are on the individual retail side items but there's the power backups that are on the the what's on the poles our equipment not the retail equipment so do we put it in Correct. both we put it in both yes. then okay so, yes. so okay so Okay, now, now we have powers. Great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ray <laughs> and Siobhan. <laughs> I mean, but I, I, last year when we submitted this budget to the uh, towns, did we include an attachment which had a definition for each line item? Here, here, here it was. This was the budget that we sent last year. So, no, we didn't. Okay. Because it was, they were all did we fairly. Ever, did we get any questions from no, any towns? No, we did not. Uh, I did, um, in, you know, in-person questions when reporting to my town. You did? Oh, good. Did they ask about redundancy for VoIP? <laughs> it hadn't come up yet. I think Ooh. it was things like, oh, gee, legal, explain more about legal, and uh, what do you mean by software, and things like that. I see. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure nobody on my select board has ever even talked about redundancy in their lives. And I'm I I I'm gonna be that gal and say this is for the towns. We just need to be within an order of magnitude on these things. And I I'm I'm sorry. I've we're, been in meetings all day. All I know we're all exhausted, but I'm really? pretty sure I if we put it on here, I will be asked. So what is a cog and what is ODS and yeah, because so this ODN maintenance and retail equipment cogs. So yeah, your people are going to ask about it. Montpelier's people are going to ask about it. Um, Barry Town or Barry City might. So Jeremy, just pick out the acronyms and it'll be okay. 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 Anything else? And. Uh, do we have any interest, Eva, that's missing the I? No, it's not. E-B-I-T-D-A, no? Okay. I was following the, um, yeah. I was following what um, what they had, what uh, he had in there, and he did not include interest. So I added okay. interest back in, so there you go. It, it's a different interest, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. I think I think it's EBITDA strange. it's interest. That's okay. right, go ahead, Michael. Oh, okay. You got it. All right. Thanks, Alan. Yielding um yielding the, the bandwidth back. Uh so <clears throat> I'm I'm going to declare this done. If you have <laughs> if you have any more thoughts, um prayers, wishes. Um, encouragement, please send it to me. I'm going to, I'm just going to move forward um, and send this to the towns. So if you want to make a motion, that is your prerogative. Oh, one, one question, what about the red and the green? Are you leaving that? Yes, I'm leaving that because it's revenues and expenditures. Should All I right. not? Should I not? I don't know. Don't, David wants to comment on this. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to send this to the towns. Anybody object? Good. Great. No. David's muted. 
Okay, that's good. Now I think David's probably muted, so we don't hear his his cursing and his get. Let's get on with it. Okay. Decisions about initial fiber build. I think luckily Chuck has helped us make this decision already. So let's let's skip that one. Let's go straight to. Um, let's go straight to round table. Um, I will start this time. Um, I had a conversation. There's there's still some talk about capacity with uh, fiber builds and line workers and people able to do fiber and splicing. And so the conversation is now, um, I think just, just about everybody who's, who's important in the decision is, is aware of, um, of the situation. So Department of Labor, we'll hear about it soon, CCV, VTC, uh, the Department of Public Service. They know that we need more people trained up to do the uh, fiber construction and to do the fiber uh, line worker stuff. So that is in the pipeline. I just wanted to let you know that I was a little bit privy to some of those conversations. Um, Alan is left. Uh, Andy? I'm good. Okie dokie. Um, Chuck? Thank you, everyone. Uh, David? Okay, I, hear, I read your lips and you said thank you, and that was it. Okay. Uh, Henry? Uh, it's an exciting time. I'm willing to help with uh, the grant writing proposals that we need to do in the short term. I think that we maybe we need some working groups for tackling some of these different areas that we identified in the business development meeting. It's exciting, though. It's and then things are really coming along. All right. Thanks, Henry. Jeremy. Just want to say thanks to everyone who's putting in so much work. It's pretty incredible, pretty amazing. Thanks, everyone. Uh, John. I just want to apologize for missing quite a few meetings recently. Uh, we've been very busy here in Marshfield doing other things, and so I keep forgetting about meetings. I'll do better. <laughs> thanks, John. Uh, Josh? Uh, just thanks, everyone. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I want to apologize. I want to practice on you folks a little bit. I have to talk to um, this consultant that's being given $450,000 to help with emergency planning. And um, part of the emergency, you know, this COVID thing is, is really put a lot of focus on telecommunications and the CUDs, I think, have been a beneficiary of it. But understanding that the emergency, not just because of COVID, is going to last longer than 2020 and 2021, because what we're seeing is telehealth, remote work, remote learning, those activities are going to go beyond the emergency. So that's why we're able to justify kind of the emergency planning but as I say, CUDs have been a beneficiary, and I think we're, we're starting to understand the long-term role of CUDs um, in terms of being a provider that goes beyond what the market has been able to provide the last few years. So, so anyway, I'm practicing on you folks because I have to have, do the spiel with the consultant. And then there's another piece that I've raised before that I'm going to raise, you know, raise repeatedly. And that is the American Community Survey tracks how people get their internet service. And one of the things that's happened over the last five years is more and more people get more and more of their internet service from mobile, mobile wireless. And as we get greater penetration of 4G and we, in, in our rural areas, but get 5G introduced in our urban areas, that is going to be even greater. And so understanding what our role as a CUD is in terms of mobile wireless is, I think, a task that I'm going to ask this consultant to really give some thought to and help us CUDs consider. So as I say, I'm sorry, I, I rambled a little bit, but I need to practice because I have to try to make the pitch to the, these folks. And just so you know, the consultant, one of the team members in the consultant is Matt Dunn's organization, whatever it's called, Rural Initiatives or something. Um, so that's those are the folks I'm talking to this week. Thank you. Thanks for the update, Ken. Michael? I was just going to say see you next week, but now I have to answer Ken. I think the role for C.
you'd use in relation to wireless is to make sure there's enough taps on the poles or slack on the poles to provide connections to those wireless radios that are going to be interspersed down the roads on the poles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and then the, the implicit see you next week then. Is that the end there? <laughs> so I'm just, just checking. <laughs> All right. Ray? Uh, pass, thanks. Siobhan? So I just want to say, Ken, the other thing to keep in mind, I have several friends who do, their entire job is online and has been since the very beginning, they do tech support. And the, their employers require them to have a wired connection to the house. They can't use a wireless connection, they're not allowed to, for whatever reason. I don't know what the reasons are, but I have three friends who have jobs like this. So <laughs> that's another reason why wire to the house is important. Just because that's going to help bring jobs into the area, bring people into the area, and hopefully re help revitalize some of these communities that are suffering because people are leaving. I'm done. Thanks, Siobhan. Tim? I'm good, thank you. All right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Tom? Yes, um, I'm surprised. I mean, after all of these uh, meetings that we, are, we keep talking about the chance to have this <laughs> knockdown, drag out fight over where we're gonna start building and have it come down to a unanimous decision and like just kind of a side part of our meeting. You know, <laughs> what do we come to these meetings for? <laughs> Yeah. Way to sneak it in there, yeah. Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted a fight. Let's fight. <laughs> no, I'm good. Thanks, everybody. All right. Sounds good. Um, let's let's adjourn, and we'll see you all next week. Have a good one. Oh, and congrats, Bye. Michael, on your award. Oh, thank yeah. you.